Good morning. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, the last time I spoke uh, with this kind of an audience uh, was on emotional intelligence. That was like five, six years ago. And now I'm happy to speak on artificial intelligence. <laughs> okay. But one thing happened last time when I spoke on emotional intelligence. Some of the people became emotional. Now here I don't want you to be artificial after this, after this session. And some people embraced AI as one of their skill set. So definitely, you know, for those who are new to AI, I would recommend to embrace AI. And the rest were already experts. So, you know, just, just go ahead. Uh, before we move on, you know, uh, on the main topic of our presentation, which is leveraging AI and ML in the field of telecommunications, I want you to see a short video, okay? Because I understand that, you know, videos are, uh, you know, a nice uh, way to communicate messages. You will get uh, quickly and uh, accurately, you know, what, what's going on, right? Yeah, uh, it's hard to get noticed when you're new, but that's okay, I'm not looking for attention. I'm happy just helping people out, making their work lives work better. I take care of the routine stuff so others don't have to. I guess you could say I'm wired that way. <laughs> I happen to do things a little differently, uh, so work gets done faster. I've gotten so good at it, it almost takes care of itself. I usually solve problems before they come up. I'm a good listener. I pay attention to the details, uh, look for patterns. What can I say? I, I love data. Intelligence doesn't come easy. I'm learning new stuff all the time. So I can make suggestions and help out more. I don't expect any fanfare, a pat on the back, or, or even a thank you. The way I figure it, if I'm doing my job right, people won't really know I'm there. And you know what's funny? Even though they don't seem to notice, I see the difference I make. And at the end of the day, that's enough for me. Why do I do it? I don't know. It's just how I'm made. All right, so I hope you like it. Any quick uh, comments from this video? Anyone? Yes. Right, right. To do, you know, to, to take care of the monotonous BAU things, right? Very good. Two things happen itself. Right, right. Which the machines can uh, pick it up instead of us. Right, excellent. All right, so guys, I want this to be a very interactive and engaging discussion, okay? Because at the end of the day, if you see, AI is about real-time engagement, right? And this is the theme that I would like, you know, all of us to, uh, to embrace during this uh, presentation. Of course, you know, uh, I plan to speak for around 40, 45 minutes. We will reserve the last five, 10 minutes for the uh, question and answer session. And if there are more questions, definitely, you know, we can meet at the booth. And if I cannot answer, you know, we have a, a battery of experts from Amdocs that, are, uh, that have joined us today. And I'm sure that, you know, you can get the answers from them. Okay? Any guesses? So it's driverless cars, right? It's AI in the field of uh, automotive industry. Will this work in India? Maybe in 50, 100 years, right? We need sensors across all traffic poles. So that means, you know, we need 5G. What about this? It's uh, robotic assisted surgery for high precision and low invasive surgeries, right? That are, that are assisting doctors 
across the world and you know which is in turn uh, good for human beings because it means we will recover fast have less scars on our body any guesses yes right so the great anil kumble spinned off his own company right spectacom and he has a tie up with uh, his fellow bangalorean satya nadella from microsoft to basically you know uh, introduce chip on the bat and on the batsman's arm to collect statistics so that it can help it can help players and coaches to to improvise continuously and not only that you know these analytics can go to the uh, sports fans so as to engage them continuously and make it more interesting what about this right okay okay so intelligent campaigning right i mean uh, the the uh, the companies get the sentiments analysis from the from across the media social media uh, you know from from uh, the the tv and from the people's feelings so that they can in turn help in the right in using the right choice of words during political campaigns right and also uh, not only that if you re if you recall uh, during the recent elections in russia we had alice right and who is alice he's an ai robot who ran the presidential elections and he won like uh, 25000 votes maybe this is the future maybe not i mean it's it's a, it's a gray area but uh, you know ai is in every field it's in everywhere and uh, also in telco that you will see in the coming slides right how it is being implemented and uh, helping people and helping the communication service providers so this is uh, briefly the agenda of my talk uh, the it and telecom evolution ai in telco the analysts view um how the ai how the cxos are shifting gears in implementation of ai in the in this industry uh i have several use cases to to take you through uh the the journey some of the interesting journey that we have uh in in the in the telco space and then finally a summary followed by a q and a okay i will also have uh trivia questions to keep you engaged because i know that you know if you are not from this domain uh you know it can be a little boring for you but since i understood from the uh, convener of this uh, this conference that 60 to 70% uh, is uh, is from development community who are mostly you know uh, nerds in technology so i have i have simple questions for you on statistics and ml okay and if you answer that correctly uh you know you will get some bri uh, prizes at the booth okay all right so this is a very busy slide but in short you know ever since uh, we had uh, analog telephone in 1880 it's almost 140 50 years now the, the the way the telecom has evolved from an analog to a digital to a mobile phone and then to internet and smart connected devices right so what it meant is that we moved from connecting sites to connecting people and now to connected devices similarly the it industry moved from evolved from mainframe computing to pc to internet and then to cloud computing right now what it means that in the year 2000 people were equipped with the uh, internet that brings them a wealth of information almost any time anywhere right and also an interesting thing happened that both the internet and the telecom have converged and there was a technological shift running mobile on gsm cdma network was no longer the uh, uh, was no was no longer needed so it basically you know it, it there was a unified mobile internet and people could uh, basically access the the information anytime anywhere right on their mobiles right so today we have millions of connected devices 
that basically internet is processing and managing this information and enabling stronger communications with the people, right? So that means people have a very strong control over the physical world. I mean, sitting in the office, I can manage my home. You know, I can, I can record my own content on my uh, setup box. I can operate my electricity, uh, you know, sitting from my office, right? I can switch on my AC before even I reach home so that I get into a, a nicer environment in this hot summer. Before we go further, you know, most of the disruption, most of the technological evolution is basically being driven by the millennials and the Gen Y, right? I see that, you know, some of us are Gen Y here and uh, some of us are Gen X, so our kids are also driving this. Because at the age of three, four years, they're having, uh, you know, the tabs to do their learning, to see the content. So for them, and also for the youth, and you know, also our behavior is changing because, because of this technology shift. So we, we are looking for three things in general, you know, the reliability, that means the quality of the content, and we are looking the content to be at a faster, at a faster pace and available to us 24 by seven. So it's on demand. So we are no longer the passive customers of the past when we, when we would switch on Doordarshan and then, you know, we would see Chitrahar, you know, at Sunday 8 a.m. or 8, uh, or 8.30 p.m., I forgot the timing, um, or see Mahabharat or see Ramayana, at a particular, you know, pro we, we just now go onto the internet and see on YouTube, see, uh, you know, record our own content at our own will, right? So reliability, faster speed, and on demand, 24 by 7 is the key thing to remember that is driving uh, this industry to, uh, to move the needle and also every other industry. So as I said, I want to keep it very engaging. Any, any guesses on the total number of mobile subscribers across the world? And you would get a prize if you answer it. Sorry? Close. 2.7, wow, you're a machine learning guy. <laughs> you want to be <laughs> Okay, so it's five billion subscribers, okay? What about India? Any guess? 75 crores, meaning 0.7 million, right? Or 750 million. That was probably, you know, two years ago. Right now we are 1.2 billion, okay? What about the 600 million that you see on the left? Any guesses? Sorry? Smartphone, what's your name? He needs to get a prize, yeah, exactly. So that's 50% of the mobile subscribers are smartphone users, right? Remember this. What about the broad broadband services, both wireline and uh, wireless in the world? Sorry? One million. Billion or million? Billion. I think a little bit more than that. Yes. You said three or four? Around three, okay. So close by, but you know, 30% less. So 4 billion subscribers. What about India? You can tell this. One point? 1.2 billion. Million. Half a billion. Okay. Any guesses on the total size of data that we push onto the internet every day? Million of, that's 10 power. Is it 10 power 18? Okay, 
uh, but still, you know, it's it's a less. It's 2.5 quinty billions of data. 2.5 into 10 power 18. Okay, and this is not going to reduce anymore because of the IoT evolution and because of the smart environments. This is going to just drastically increase. Two years ago, it was not like this. Okay. Most of the data increase is only in the last two years because of the connected devices. What about number of SMSs across the world? Any guesses? Twenty million billion. I think you're talking about WhatsApp. Not SMSs. No, it's much much lesser. Okay, it's in millions. Between ten to twenty. How much you said? How much? Thirteen. We can give her a prize. What's her name? Brinda. Okay, so it's sixteen million. Okay, it's not 13, it's 16 million, but you were close. What about WhatsApp? You had some number. 20 billion. Probably this was like four years ago. Sorry? Yeah. So just, you know, I'll give you a hint. Number of subscribers in the world is 5 billion. 4 to 5 messages per day, per subscriber. Eighty, ninety. Little bit more. Sorry? 100 billion. No, no, even 80 is higher right now. Probably that's where we'll be in a year and a half from now. 60 billion. What's your name, sir? Ashfaq. He gets the prize. It's 65 billion. Okay? And I have not included calls because the, the current generation, we don't call that much for our, in our personal lives, right? Even I call my parents once a week, although they are in India. It's mostly around text. You know, our kids are inventing new acronyms, ROFL, LOL, whatever. I mean, sometimes I don't know what they're talking. Then I would ask, what do you mean? Right? Oh, ROFL means this. Okay. So it's all about, you know, texting. That's why you see the WhatsApp is, you know, uh, almost, uh, I don't know, 300, 400 times than the number of SMSs. Right? Okay. So he's, he's helping me with the timing, because number of Facebook logins, quickly, per day. You have the answer, 1.5 billion. Okay, And then you can extrapolate it to the total number of Google searches, YouTube videos, Instagrams. So basically, this is huge data that we are talking about, right? And the, uh, the telecommunication service providers are sitting on a gold mine of data along with the uh, partners like Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, and all, all these partners. And they have this information at their hands to basically analyze and process to improve the quality of service they provide to their customers. And not only that, to give more proactive care and offerings to the right customers at the right time. Okay? So this is what the, the crux of AI is about in telco. It's about engaging with customers at the right time, with the right offerings, and thereby you know, keeping them uh, more satisfied than ever before. So a quick uh, view on the, uh, uh, on the telco industry from the analysts. As you can see, 85% of uh, CIOs are going to implement AI by 2020, and we are in 2019. That means the maturity of AI in this industry is still in the starting uh, phase. 27% okay? of CIOs would have increased their investment in AI 
um, by 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 next year. Okay, and in 2021, the AI implementations across the world in all domains is going to have an impact on the business value by three trillion dollars, close to three trillion. Specifically to telco, it's going to be around ten billion dollars. The last but not the least, and we have uh, also heard in the keynote speech about data and data governance, right? The fundamental layer to all artificial intelligence is about having clean data. So right now the decision makers in this industry are unable to make sense out of it or a large sense out of it to drive uh, key insights, right? So as I said, I mean, the, uh, the CXOs are shifting gears in this industry. They are figuring out, you know, how to uh, handle the data, which is the number one challenge, and we will see why in the next slide. They're moving from the hype to actual implementation. They figured out that, you know, implementing AI only in one channel, like bot or an IVR, is an absolute failure, and they need to have AI everywhere. Shifting to the cloud. Right, to take leverage of the scalability and uh, have their workforce more focused on delivering business value. And then the sharing of the data, okay? I will not talk about data sharing any further, but the key message is that CSPs are no longer, you know, keeping all the data to themselves or, you know, trying to process it within their IT organization or giving it to the big vendors to solve their problems. But they're also looking at the small niche boutique startups, the university graduates who have solutions, who have machine learning algorithms to create the right insights for specific problems. And they're inviting them to join their workforce, right, and to solve these problems. And they are willing to share the data with these guys in uh, utmost confidence that they can actually solve the problem much faster and easier than anyone else. So as I said, this is the first uh, trivia. It's a very simple one. I believe I will have at least five answers. So if P, the significance test, is 0 0.01 and the threshold or the risk level alpha is 0 0.05, which of these are correct? You cannot answer here from Hamptons. So H0 is null hypothesis. HA is alternate hypothesis, right? Accept null hypothesis. Okay, any other answers? Sorry, C. C, who's that? Who said that? C, reject null hypothesis. It's not that only one answer is correct. Even two can be correct. Okay, so he gets it. So basically if you reject null hypothesis, that means so both three and four mean the same. So anyway, he, he will get the prize. What's your name? Harshad. 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 Thanks. So data is the underlying ingredient to all your machine learning, business logic, and business process improvement, right? So and there is a huge challenge today with data quality in telco. I mean. Typically, we see that you know the communication service providers have at least 50 to 100 sources of data, maintaining billing, network commissioning, you know, campaign management, inventory, and so on and so forth. And most of them are legacy because you know, they, as you can see, they are coming from at least 150 years old uh, time uh, difference. Some of them have modernized, obviously. And the, the, the key thing is having their data real time so as to be able to uh, derive the right action and benefit the customer. Because even a 15 minute lag 
it means you know it's a lost uh, opportunity and it will not basically you know prevent uh, uh, prevent any malfunction or uh, you know it will it will not increase the customer satisfaction right so and data quality is our utmost importance i mean if we inject garbage we're going to get out garbage uh, keeping data security right from the beginning you know what what data layer to be exposed to the public what should be protected what should be private should be there right from the beginning okay it's not that you know in the end you build a nice ods nice data warehouse platform and everything is exposed to you know all the mbnos that the telcos are working with it cannot be right of course you know uh, meshing you know the first and the third party data you know with the wide variety of data that is available is a key uh, thing that we need to manage so that you know we have the right analytical model in place in order to uh, you know inject the right ingredient into the machine learning process thereby you know leveraging it to have the right insights in the business process so as i said the cios and the cdos there is a new position there is a chief data officer uh in the in the industry now to just manage the data it's no longer it organization that looks at all the enterprise it's a separate organization it's a cdo organization that looks at data and handles within the csps so they are moving from you know i need ai to i have implemented ai in a particular uh, uh channel you know like the ivr or the bots to actually implement ai everywhere okay that's actually taking the huge competitive advantage if you implement the ai across your organization across your all the business process so ai powered cat catalog using the machine learning process to figure out you know what offerings are more successful and what offerings can actually uh, be rolled out much quicker and have a better roi to the csps and also to the customers ai in the network this is a very uh, uh complex thing to handle basically you know having the machines to do the uh, network optimization you know on the live network to figure out the network congestion issues the call drop issues that we have you know almost uh, on a daily basis depending on where you are right because of the spectrum uh, constraints etc so ai plays an important role in the network optimization proactive and preemptive care i mean you need if if you are uh, approached by the csps before an event happens right you appreciate that otherwise you know uh, if you get a big bill by end of next billing cycle and you are like 30% 40% overrun on your usage you're going to be dissatisfied right so it's actually taking care of the uh, the pain points that a customer is going through and uh, informing you proactively so that you know you are aware of it and there is a solution to the problem at this right time power b2b be experience it's about smart ranking the business accounts and roll out the right offerings to the business accounts ai driven media experience this is a very interesting use case you know you will understand more when we go to the use case but i will not talk much about it here contextual customer engagement is about you know providing more self service tools and processes so as so that you know you can use them to resolve the issues you know without having to call the call center and wait for half an hour or one hour and then you know ultimately lining up with the essay of one day to resolve your problems so basically you know uh, within the csps organizations right the ai is implemented across the the care and operations business process so proactive care is about you know scouting all the data from the customer from the customer experiences and trying to understand the pains that they are going through and actually reaching them out before or on time so as to give them a solution to 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 fix their issues self service for care as i said you know it's giving them more tools and processes on their own mobile phone or on their own uh, you know uh, ipads so that they can resolve problems on their own rather than having to reach out to the call center or idr or to the csp 
Here operation is basically auto-detecting all the network anomalies and all the, uh, uh, the, the billing issues that could actually land up the customer in big problem. So having this intelligent insights on a dashboard so that the operations could uh, take the right action at the right time. Agent assist. So when you call a call center agent, uh, you know, gone are the days when, uh, you know, you would have to wait for 15 minutes, explain the problem for another 15 minutes, and then you get to hear from the agent that, you know, okay, I have noted all your uh, uh, issues, the, I will get back to you within a day, okay, I'll send you a technician to fix the problem. So gone are these days, because the agent is equipped with why you're calling, what are the reasons, what is the next solution, so that you can close the issue faster and also keep the customers happy. So proactive care and self-service basically reduce the call center call reduction and also increase the customer satisfaction. While the care operations and agent assist improve the operational efficiency, okay, and also you know the first call resolution time. And also, you know, an important thing to know when you are interacting with a call center agent, right? And he fixes the problem for you in let's say five, ten minutes, and you're happy. He also knows that you're probably looking for an additional offering. Right? He gets it the, he gets this intelligent insight from the from the agent dashboard. And he would say, hey, will you be uh, okay to take this? And when the customer is happy, it's more often than not that he will deny such an offering. So it basically uses this opportunity to leverage upsell. Trivia 2. It's a very simple thing, right? So in supervised learning, we have basically regression type of models and classifier type of models. So what's the outcome of a regression model? Great. What is your name, sir? Tarun. What about a classifier model? Yes. What's your name? Aniket. Aniket. Thank you. Category or a class. Right. Let's move forward. How are we doing on the time? Okay, I need to be fast. Use cases. So you saw all the theory so far. Now I want you to go through the use cases to sort of appreciate, you know, how it's actually being done, right? And how it's adding value to the to the communication service provider as well as to the customers like us. So Jack is a millennial, is a university student, is very social savvy. What that means is actually, you know, he's a big, uh, he's at risk because he always uses data, he consumes more than what he actually has uh, signed up for. So the operations uh, figured out that he has actually, you know, he's more than 30% on his usage. What that means is that a high bill, right? So when he will see the bill, he will get a shock. What happens to you when you see a higher bill? Exactly. So churn risk. So the machine learning model has already predicted that whenever a customer sees a high bill, there is 75% churn risk. Right? What would you appreciate? I mean, if you would appreciate a call or a text from the CSP telling you that you are at risk and not after the fact. And then here, they are also providing him an extra offering, you know, which could eventually reduce the, uh, the bill overrun by, uh, you know, by, by taking the 1 GB value added service, the 1 GB extra promotion at $12. Right? So this is a good use case where you can prevent uh, customer to actually churn out consciously or unconsciously due to, due to his own issue, right? Another example is a multiplayer customer ordered a, a, a media streamer 
okay? And he would get an email right on his mobile phone on how to hook it up and how to make it operational. So he follows it. He hooks it onto the TV. And immediately the CSP figures out from the network layer that there is a buffering issue from the streamer. Okay? So they immediately open a chatbot on his TV and try to get access and try to communicate to him. We see a problem with your uh, streamer. So they apply a deep learning model and figure out that actually, you know, he is having a 100 Mbps connection, but the streamer has a download speed of 8 Mbps. So there's a problem with the streamer. Okay? And they roll him an offer of upgrading by adding a repeater device at 50% uh, less price if he, if he buys it now. Now what happens if AI is not there, right? You spend an hour troubleshooting yourself and then you know you call the call center and you know as, as we talked before they will note all the issues and they said okay I'll send a technician to your house. He will come after two days and then he will figure out that there is a problem and then another one week to actually send a repeater device. Now the whole process is now optimized to few minutes, right? So it's bringing down days into minutes. This is an excellent example of, uh, you know, the agent assist dashboard, right? So we see that Owen is calling the call center right now. And the agent has figured out that he's calling because of a high bill issue. So the KPIs which the machine learning models uh, generate and score are injected onto this dashboard. So the agent already knows why he is calling before even Owen speaks, right? And they also know, you know, why he is overshot his uh, usage because his son saw 16 videos on demand compared to like 5 to 10 which he has signed up for. They went to UK or an international place and his son started calling his friends uh, international calls and he's 57% up on the overall content that he's uh, limited to. So immediately they see that uh, Owen is a high lifetime value customer. He's a multiplayer customer. So he's paying around $170 per, per month. Okay, he has TV, he has broadband, he has mobile from the same CSP. He's a fairly happy customer, high net promoter score, and his churn propensity is medium. So, you know, the, the AI has suggested to the agent to actually waive the extra fees, so as not to lose this, uh, you know, loyal customer and a high value customer. Trivia 3. Are you ready for it? So which of the following machine learning techniques are commonly used while building ML and AI programs? Bifurcation of data into different categories based on attributes. Combining similar objects into clusters of related attributes. Finding correlation between variables to predict which one will follow the other. Oh, well, not, not all of you can win a prize. <laughs> And I don't have to. I don't have a way to figure out who said all first. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, all of the above is correct. What is what is A principally? Sorry. Clustering. And what is B? A is also clustering. B is also clustering. Okay, right, so in the interest of time, I'll move forward, okay. So this is, uh, you know, uh, David is a high value customer, he's a sports fan. So as soon as he logs into the uh, service provider's website, he get a personalized ad that there is a 10% offering on a new sports package, which obviously, you know, is more than uh, 
expected to, to take it, right? Because he's a sports fan and there's a new sports channel. And he also gets an additional offer on the cloud DVR uh, as soon as he logs into the website. So this is contextual advertisement targeting specific uh, customers based on their interests, based on their customer 360 intents. AI driven media expense, uh, media experiences. If you saw, in, we, we, we briefly touched in the earlier slide, right? So here, uh, again, David, he's a football fan. Uh, he also loves music. He's been with the CSP for more than eight years. And uh, the CSP has figured out that his last digital footprint was on Adidas and Facebook. So obviously, he was trying to you know, probably he was interested in some Adidas shoes. So he's, he's watching a football game and he gets an advertisement on his cell phone that, you know, there is a 50% discount on the, uh, on the Adidas shoes, okay, which his favorite player is probably wearing. So there is, there is a good chance that he will go ahead and uh, accept this offer, right? Are we okay on time? No, okay. So, <laughs> you know, networks is a very complex thing, right? Because we moved from the physical to the virtual network, that's enabling rollout of services. Broadband services initially used to take like two weeks, and now it's probably a few days, right? Assuming that the last mile is set up and all. And then, you know, uh, trying to uh, roll out the uh, intelligent offerings. Network is no longer a passive element. It's much more smarter software driven in order to roll out these offerings for example a new video to customers worldwide earlier it used to take like uh, you know several thousands of clicks error prone but sd has actually come in and uh, taken charge of the control panel so that it can do it faster quicker and more accurately but then the problem was not resolved because you know you had uh, data centers in one location and how to connect them to data centers in another location. So NFV was brought in, NFV was invented so as to virtualize some of the services like your firewall and your router so that it can be, uh, these services can be rolled out across data centers much faster. But that's not enough, guys. In order to figure out you know, what's happening in the network, with billions of nodes, you saw the number of subscribers that we have across the world. Across the world, we need autonomous machine learning processes that can actually take control and monitor the network in order to optimize real time the live network. You know, because we can configure the VFNs, which are the virtual network elements, almost in real time to keep the same quality of service, and then therefore keep the customers happy. Right. But before giving control to the machines, also the machines need to uh, develop trust with the humans, right? In order to you know, uh, take uh, a bunch of very highly experienced network engineers to do something else in their lives and to let machine control, the machine need to prove before we actually go ahead and do that, right? So there's a lot of uh, innovation and thought leadership in this uh, Automize, aut autonomous operations in the network. NFE is like five years old, and right now we are still thinking how to make it much more automated. Okay, but that's the need of the hour. So just, you know, Kate is basically trying to, uh, uh, you know, install the setup box, and uh, she's struggling with it already twice. She, she started to follow the standard operating procedure for the third time. Right, and the chatbot doesn't know that it is the third time, and then there is no way to connect from chatbot to the uh, uh, to the agent. Therefore, you know it's unsatisfied customer, lower NPS. I'll skip the trivia four. We can do at the booth. So cloud, you know, uh, there is a survey which says that the self-service BI analytics is driving the shift to the cloud. But still, within the next three to four years, 43% of the customers will still be on hybrid, 18% on pure BI analytics. This basically means we leverage the cloud to, f to let the IT organization focus more on delivering business value 
rather than dealing with the complex data centers and all the operations, right? And also to leverage the out-of-box machine learning models that the likes of AWS and Google and Microsoft and SAP, they bring to the table so that the organizations can kickstart and, and move fast. So operationalizing AI is much more than data science. You know, you need to have a strong strategy in place, what you're trying to resolve, and then have clean data. Use the ML models. I mean, pretty much in telco use cases, we don't need to, it's not a rocket science. We understand the data. The guys are very experienced. There's not a lot of bias introduced in the data on a daily basis. So they use the regular, you know, supervised and unsupervised learning methods to, uh, uh, to, to, deal, uh, to, to build the KPIs that drive the business insights, right? But we need to monitor them and make sure that they're delivering business value. I mean, if you have 100 models, it's okay. But if you scale it up to 1,000, the IT and the data organization need to be on top of it. So that's where you know, uh, the real challenge is, to, to be on top of it almost on a daily basis so that the business is getting the right, the right insights and at real time to take advantage of it and to have happy customers in the end of the day, okay? There's a lot of fear that you know, machines are going to replace humans in everything that we do. But as you saw in the first video, it's not the case, okay? They will take care of the monotonous BAU things so that we can do much more smarter things, right? So once we go ahead and uh, you know, uh, kill this fear factor, we can really use it for a competitive advantage. And this is what is happening in every industry. So ultimately, AI to the CSPs is to optimize efficiencies, to increase their revenues by rolling out the right offerings at the right time, to increase the CSAT, proactive care, proactive anomaly detections, and to decrease churn. So that's it, guys, from me. Now it's open to uh, Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. More in the telecom space for analytics, data storage, processing. Any any thoughts on that? So we, you know, we. Uh, I mean, the, the CSPs are not stuck to a particular, uh, you know, Cloudera or Hortonworks or any big data platform, right? So we, uh, we do a wide array of technologies. You know, Teradata is used mostly for analytic space because it's faster read and write. And Hadoop for the big data stack. And if you see on the visualization, you know, we have a Tableau, uh, you know, uh, MSTR, MicroStrategy, and all those tools. As far as machine learning is concerned, we generally do not invent new algorithms. We try to use most of the standard supervised, unsupervised learning models. And that's enough. That gives like 80% accuracy. And you know, 80% accuracy is very good in this domain, considering the variety of data and the volumes of data. Okay? And pretty much, you know, cu customers are open to uh, embrace any technology. Uh, basically, it's mostly driven by, you know, the, the confidence that the CIOs have in a particular partner, right? That plays a key role because at the end of the day, I mean, on the cloud, in the BI space, uh, in, the, in the telco space, Azure is considered to be a little more powerful, okay, in the BI space, while AWS is on the enterprise software, right? For example, billing and network and all of this mostly run on AWS. So, it depends on what the customer needs and what is the right uh, technology to resolve the problems that they are looking for. All right, so any more questions, feel free to contact me or any of our uh, experts at the Amdocs booth. I also encourage you to uh, see us at the Amdocs booth and have uh, good demos of our uh, services that we are offering. Thank you very much.